How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donnie here again, this time taking a look at 21.2 stuff, patterns of nuclear stability. Our objectives are to describe the different types and properties of radioactive decay and to use them in nuclear reaction equations. <clears throat> we also want to be able to describe the factors that influence nuclear stability and analyze nuclei to determine their stability and what mode of decay is likely for the unstable nuclei. All right, first thing, it's like, well, why are things radioactive in the first place? So long story short, it's the nucleus is unstable. That's why things are radioactive. You have an unstable nucleus. There's many reasons that may influence this stability, and we're going to talk about them. One is the neutron to proton ratio, <coughs> the existence of magic numbers, uh, even number of protons or neutrons, and those are going to be things that we look at in more detail. But first off, why are nuclei stable in the first place? Shouldn't the protons repel each other? They're both positively charged. How can we get a nucleus full of protons when these protons have the same charge and they're going to want to repel each other? How, how's that even possible? All right, well, like charges repel, there's this thing that we call the strong nuclear force. Uh, protons repel each other because of their charge, but... As they get really close to each other, the strong nuclear force dominates. That should not be for, it should be force. Dominates. It's kind of like a Velcro. So if I'm taking a look at these two protons at a distance, they want to repel each other because they have the same charge. They're both positively charged. But as we force them to get close together, now it's kind of like there was Velcro, and now they're stuck together. Even though they repel each other, the Velcro is stronger than that repulsion. That Velcro is the strong nuclear force. So if a nucleus gets too big, though, the nucleons won't be held close enough together for the strong nuclear force to dominate, and it can become unstable. So if the nuclei get too big, that Velcro is not going to be strong enough to hold all of them together. Neutrons also are going to help with stability, right? If we just had a bunch of protons, that's not going to be as stable as if we threw in some neutrons there. All right, so now we got this neutron to proton ratio. We call this the belt of stability. And if you take a look, the stable is the very, very dark red. And if you take a look, you can kind of see in the middle right there, we have a belt of stability. That's where the things are stable. For smaller nuclei, we have about a one to one ratio for neutrons to protons. So if we see over here on the y-axis, we got neutrons. And over on the x-axis, we got charge, which is from the protons, right? So the larger atomic number, uh, things greater than atomic number 20, so past this point, it shifts to a 1.5 to 1 ratio of neutrons to protons. So if you can see here, the first 20 kind of form this one to the slope of one kind of line. And then these other ones, they start to go at a different angle, a different slope, a 1.5 to 1. So if you're above the belt in this area, if you're up there, that means that you have too many neutrons. So what kind of decay will convert a neutron to a proton? Well, beta decay will do that, right? We have a neutron, and it's giving off a beta particle uh, and becoming a proton. So this is one way to go, hey, oh, did I do that? Yeah. One way to go, hey, if I got too many neutrons, why don't I turn one of them into a proton? That way I have more protons and less neutrons, and I can become more stable. Well, what about if you're below the belt in this area over here? Well, in that instance, you have too many protons. So do we know of any decays that will convert a proton into a neutron? We sure do. Positron emission, right? So if we had a proton and we gave off a positron, that is going to give us a neutron, right? Or if we did electron capture, where an electron falls in and essentially converts a proton into a neutron. So above the belt, we get beta decay below the belt, we get positron emission or electron capture. Both of those, the positron emission and electron capture, will convert a proton into a neutron. And for things that are above atomic number 84, which is like right around here, you see there are no more stable isotopes. There's no more stable ones. Why not? They're too big. So what kind of decay is going to get rid of stuff, a bunch of stuff? That's going to be the alpha particle emission. So anywhere above this point, we're going to get alpha decay. So how about we try predicting the decay type for carbon-14? 
Well, I know carbon has an atomic number of six and a mass of 14. So that tells me that I got six protons and I must have eight neutrons. So it's going to give me an eight to six ratio. But for the smaller elements below 20, it's better and more stable to have a one to one ratio. So I got too many neutrons. So what kind of decay is going to change a neutron into a proton? Well, let me think about it, right? It's going to have to be a beta particle. So we're going to have beta particle emission. So what's going to happen is carbon-14 is going to give off a beta particle. And then what do we end up with? Well, we end up with nitrogen with a mass of 14. And in that scenario, I got seven protons and I got seven neutrons. And that's a one-to-one -one ratio. Perfect. All right, let's try this again. What about for uranium-235? Well, hey, I know uranium has an atomic number of 92, which is greater than 84, which means that nucleus is way too big. I'm going to have to give off an alpha particle. So if I were to write out that equation, I'm not going to because I don't know what it decays into. I think it's like thorium or something, but I don't really know off the top of my head. We just know it's going to be alpha. And what about iodine-121? Well, I know iodine has an atomic number of 53. So I got iodine, atomic number 53, and a mass of 121, which tells me that I have 68 neutrons and I have 53 protons. Now, for the atomic numbers greater than 20, like iodine is, it's better to have a 1.5 to 1 neutron to proton ratio uh, because it's more stable then. So I go, all right, well, if I had this many protons, what would 1.5 neutrons be? That would be just about 80 neutrons. So it's telling me I don't have enough neutrons. I need more neutrons. So what kind of radioactive decay do I know of converts a proton into a neutron? Well, what's missing? Must be a positron. So I know that this is going to be positron emission, right? Or another notation for that would be this. So cool. All right. So what about these magic numbers? It's kind of like these elements are superstitious and they got lucky numbers, all right? When a nuclei has one of these for their amount of protons and or neutrons, they result in a more stable than usual nuclei. And these are the magic numbers, 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126 for neutrons. Because you got more than that in protons, we start getting with like things that are super radioactive or do big. All right, so, but why? Why is that so? Well, do you guys remember uh, the electron shells and filling them? looks like this, those box diagrams, two, eight, and I can keep going on, is uh, when you had a complete electron shell, right? If I had one S2, well, that's going to be helium, and I know helium is a noble gas, and it's not very reactive. It's very stable. Or if I had a total of eight electrons uh, in my valence shell, so if I were to fill this up again, hey, isn't that going to be another noble gas? It sure is, and if I recall correctly, it's going to be neon. Sure, help I'm right. Which again is a noble gas and it's more stable than other elements. It's not very reactive. So it's like that, but it's for nucleons, like protons and neutrons. Okay. So there are shells for the nucleus as well. And these numbers are like the complete octet for the nucleus instead of the electrons. So example, lead 203. Lead has 82 protons and it's stable. There's also evidence that protons and neutrons may pair themselves up in a similar way that the electrons do, just like how in one box I can have a spin up and a spin down, and there's some stability that goes with that. The protons may do that, and the neutrons may do that. So it's better to have an even number of protons and an even number of neutrons. That's where these magic numbers come from. There's also this stuff called decay chains, which isn't like it's pretty self explanatory. Some nuclei don't become stable after just one reaction after one nuclear decay, you have a chain of events, right? So if I got uranium-238 up here, well, it's super massive. It's going to give off an alpha particle, and then it's still unstable. It's thorium. It's still unstable. It's going to have to give off a beta particle, another beta particle, another alpha particle, another one, another one, another one. It's going to keep doing all these steps, and that is our decay chain. So common ones where you see decay chains would be uranium-238, uranium-235, lead-207, lead-208, thorium-232, uh, and that's the ones that we'll probably see, okay? So, summarize. I'm not going to do it for you this time. What can you say about the belt of stability 
What can you say about magic numbers? What can you tell me about the size of the nucleus? And can you predict the stability of a nucleus and or how it will decay? So that's it. All right. I hope you found that helpful. And I'll see you in class. Bring questions. All right. Goodbye.